गुड आफ्टरनून लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन असद इजाज बर्ट ऑन नया दौर टीवी ऑन पॉलिटिकल इकोनॉमी दिस वीक वी कम टू यू एवरी वीक विद अ न्यू गेस्ट विद अ न्यू टॉपिक बट मोस्टली फोकस्ड ऑन पॉलिटिक्स एंड इकोनॉमी इन पाकिस्तान टुडे आई हैव अ वेरी एक्साइटिंग गेस्ट विद मी गुंजालो हैज बीन इन पाकिस्तान विद द वर्ल्ड बैंक फॉर अबाउट फोर और फाइव इयर्स गुंजालो विद थ्रो सम लाइट ऑन हिज टेन योर इन पाकिस्तान ऑल्सो and has done some exciting work including a recent report that i have in my hand here uh, which is called from swimming in sand to high and sustainable growth i attended the launch of uh, this report and was really fascinated by the you know the breadth of research that went into it and some of the policy proposals that were made uh, for the interest of policy makers in pakistan so we decided to do a follow up session and interview with gonzalo and talk about you know not just this report but his vision on pakistan and you know what are the big economic problems that he's witnessed in pakistan and what are the solutions really so i'd welcome gonzalo to the show hi gonzalo hello asad thank you so much for the invitation how are you i'm doing fantastic thank you how's been your time in pakistan loving it extremely enriching uh, i i uh, learned a lot i've been here for about 4 years now and it has been a, a a very enriching experience a lots of learning you've really contributed to pakistan and i know people uh, in the policy circles in islamabad economists really value your contributions to the country but gonzalo without wasting any time i would i would i would like to jump to the report and try to learn from you what uh, are the are the are the main proposals in the report but i was really fascinated about a few things including you know uh, the focus on productivity you know this has been uh, a neglected area in pakistan some policy makers have pointed to low productivities in 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 various sectors so i uh, but but then again the government hasn't really focused on enhancing productivity and trying to sort of capitalize on the productivity gains uh, especially in the agriculture and uh, and infrastructure related sector so uh, so so gonzalo when you say uh, uh, when you say productivity are you just focusing on uh, capital productivity because you talk a lot about firms or are you also talking about labor productivity okay so thank you for the question I, i'm i'm talking about both things and and perhaps the the let me start by saying uh, you know if you look at last 30 years uh yes. the last 30 years so an increase in what we call labor productivity so how much value uh, an average worker in pakistan uh adds what we saw was that in the past 30 years that increased by 40% so labor productivity increased by 40% uh if you compare that to what happened in vietnam same period in vietnam labor productivity increased by 330% so by almost eight times faster but but before we get into the you know what should you do to change that situation perhaps it's worth thinking about what is it that productivity means and that goes to your question is it labor is it capital productivity uh productivity is sort of an abstract concept uh so if one talks about productivity you know the average person will say what well, what does that have to do with me but actually productivity has a very uh concrete implication productivity is very much related to the incomes that households get if you're more productive if you work in an economy that is more productive your income will be higher and if you work in an economy that is less productive your income will be lower because productivity at the end of the day is how much value you are creating in your economic activity uh so productivity is very much associated with the level of income and therefore with the welfare of households in Pakistan so that 40% increase over the last 30, three decades uh means that the average wage increased by a similar amount and the 330% productivity increase in Vietnam means that in Vietnam the average wage increased by that much eight times faster so it may sound like an abstract concept but it has very concrete implications for the average household in in the country because it means how much value they are adding and therefore how they are rewarded for that in their you know paycheck at the end of the month uh, gonzalo that's a very interesting analysis but uh as far as productivity is concerned and you know transformation in the manufacturing sector is concerned i've seen you know many papers comparing pakistan to vietnam do you think that's a 
fair comparison? And do you really think, you know, comparing perhaps not just Pakistan, but any developing country to Vietnam would be slightly unfair because, you know, Vietnam, uh, as we all know, has been an outlier of sorts. Do you think the it's, it's a fair comparison? So I, I do think it's a fair comparison, but but let's take one step back and say any compari- any comparator that you choose, right? Yeah. You can you can challenge it because no country is, is the same as other, right? So it's very difficult to make comparisons. We could we could take the case of Bangladesh, and in Bangladesh over the same period, the the labor productivity increased by about 170 percent, mm-hmm. whereas in Pakistan yeah. increased by 40. So you don't need to go to Vietnam to see that there is an issue with productivity in Pakistan that has been stagnant, but. But I still think that the case of Vietnam is an interesting point of comparison for for, uh, Pakistan. And I'll tell you why. If you go about 20, 25 years back and you look at the structure of production of Vietnam, the structure of exports of Vietnam, and you compare it to the structure of exports of Pakistan, what you will see is a very similar structure. So about 80% of exports of Vietnam at that time were textile and apparel, same as in Pakistan. The rest were agricultural goods and minerals, same as in Pakistan. Now, if you fast forward 20 years, 25 years to now, what you see in Vietnam is a complete transformation of the export basket. More electronics, you still see textiles and apparel, you still see agricultural products, but a lot of electronics, you see computers, microchips, et cetera. And what you see, the structure of so Pakistan. More, more complex goods, basically. Not only more complex goods, exactly more complex goods, yes, but also more diversified export More structure. diversified, yeah. Completely yeah. changed. Yeah. Still exporting yeah. textiles and apparel, still exporting rice, still exporting minerals, but also exporting more sophisticated, more complex products. If you yeah. fast forward the Pakistan export structure from you know comparing 2000 to 2020, 2022, what you see is no change whatsoever. The same textiles and apparel explained in a large portion of, 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 of exports, rice mainly, but other uh, foodstuffs and vegetables explaining uh, explaining the rest. So yes, Vietnam perhaps was an outlier, but it wasn't all that different in terms of structure production 20 years ago. So that brings us to what is it that Vietnam did differently from what Pakistan did and how distortions basically introduced by policy or unaddressed by policy, uh, play the role in that transformation in the case of Vietnam and play the role in the lack of transformation in the case of, of Pakistan. So I would say, um, yes, it, it, you know, it may be a little bit of an outlier, but sometimes we learn from what others that have been outliers did and how can we, you know, the extent to which we can imitate that or not. Yeah, on that point, uh, uh, Gonzalo, thank you for your answer. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, distortions in the market. Are you, uh, are you, are you basically inferring to the fact that uh, Pakistan's export basket, this export structure, could not diversify over the, you know, the period of uh, comparison or period of analysis, is because Pakistan was uh, asymmetrically incentivizing s- sectors like textile and of course in comparison to other sectors and and those incentives which were moved into uh, some industries and not other industries uh, is the is the distortions that you're talking about yes so perhaps i can give you three different types of distortions that have affected not just the composition of production right whether it's textiles or electronics as in vietnam but also the size of the export basket and also the size of the, of the, of the productive economy. Um, and in, in the report, we look at the three levels of distortions that basically shape the way in which resources are allocated in Pakistan. The first layer of distortion has to do with the fact that tax policy, in a way, incentivizes resources going into real estate and land as a store of value rather than into dynamic tradable sectors. And I'll I'll tell you why. You have negligible taxes on property and negligible taxes on land, but you have relatively high income tax 
on manufacturing sectors or in services sectors that are more dynamic, yeah. tradable, et cetera. So that means that anyone that needs to make an investment decision is going to be more inclined to invest in real estate because it's going to avoid paying taxes there. Whereas if yeah. you invest in dynamic tradable sectors, manufacturing, for example, then you have to pay more taxes. So that's the first level of distortions that moves resources to flow into non-tradables, basically real estate, away from dynamic tradables, say manufacturing, say modern services. That's one level. Now, there is still some investment, not much, going into dynamic tradable sectors. But what happens there is a second level of distortions. This, a very peculiar distortion, that is import duties. Pakistan relies heavily on import duties, import taxes. In Pakistan, import duties average about 20%. It places Pakistan among the top five countries in the world that most taxes imports. And taxes on imports are, a, are tricky taxes. The reason they are tricky taxes is because the name is misleading. You may think you're taxing imports, and yes, you are. That's where the tax is levied, right? On the, imp on the imports of a particular good. But actually the effect of those import taxes are discouraging export activities. So the tax on imports, the import duty acts as an implicit export tax. Why is that? Because say for example, if, and I, I will use the example of cheese because many people talk about cheese as you know, the, what the elites consume and therefore they should put a high <laughs> import duty. Okay, fine. <laughs> you put a high duty on cheese. In fact, import duties on cheese are about 60%. So what that does is that basically incentivizes producers domestically to produce cheese and sell it in the domestic market because the import duty at 60% discourages imports of cheese, make imports very expensive, right? And so they create extra profits for the domestic company that can sell the cheese domestically without facing import competition. Now, the other thing that these import duties do is because this firm now will have incentives to sell domestically, it will not export. It will only export after it has exploited completely the domestic market, after it has saturated the domestic market. And this is why in Pakistan, people talk about the export surplus. The reason why they talk about the export surplus is that export surplus is there not, is because high levels of protection, high levels of import duties make it highly profitable to sell domestically. So a high yeah. import duty discourages exports. So the little investment that goes into dynamic tradables actually ends up focusing in tradables, but for the domestic market, not for export markets. And the limited investment that ends up in the export market, and, and you see that there were two layers already that are discouraging exports, right? But the little that ends up going to exports nonetheless are further discouraged from diversifying into new export products by a third level of distortions that has to do with export incentives. Export incentives in Pakistan have been um, concentrated. One could say captured, but let's call them concentrated in the textile and apparel sector. If you look, for example, at, at credit subsidies that were given to exporters by SBP schemes like LTFF or EFS, they are disproportionately targeting textile and apparel. So textile and apparel got a lot of benefits from these subsidies. Similarly, DLTL, that is another export incentive that Ministry of Commerce runs, was heavily tilted in favor of textiles and apparel. So that means that if you want to produce something new and export something new, you're basically missing out on subsidies. And so you won't do it. So in a way, policies, distorsive policies, were shaping or were ensuring that that export basket never diversified, right? So you had those three layers, the tax policy that had really, really negligible taxes on real estate, that is making resources flow to real estate instead of dynamic tradables. Within those resources that went into dynamic tradables, high import duties that make resources flow into domestic oriented activities like import substituting activities rather than export oriented activities. And the little that goes into export oriented activities, you have an infrastructure around export incentives that focuses on textiles and apparel. So it's making sure that that 
export structure never diversifies. So there you have three layers that are shaping the way the economy looks now and the way the economy looked 20 or 30 years ago. Gonzalo, in my uh, thank you for a very elaborate response and for explaining what you mean by distortions. In my discussions with some policymakers, both inside and outside Pakistan, uh, you know, the fears that they express is that they, if, if, if they liberalize uh, the import market, which means that, you know, they minimize sort of, it's a very even subsidization and incentive regime, and they, you know, remove all import substitution type policies. Their fear is that these 30 billion exports that Pakistan makes, primarily, you know, 60 or 70% of which come through the textile sector, would mean that, you know, there would be a lag. And for the first four or five years, until, you know, other sectors pick up pace, these textile exports would also be gone and Pakistan would be running huge current account deficits. What are your thoughts on that? So is there a risk? The analysis uh, that we've done and that others have done uh, show that that is, that is not the case. And I'll tell you why. So on, on the export sector and those that are already exporting, reducing import tariffs, doesn't do much for those that are already exporting. The, the, only, the only channel that is linking import tariffs with that export performance of those already exporting is the fact that they will have access to better intermediates and to better capital equipment, so better machineries, so that they will be able to use better technologies, and so they will be able to export more because they will be more competitive. In fact, something that we know from international experience is that access to good quality intermediates from wherever they are produced, access to good quality technologies from wherever they are produced is something that boosts productivity and therefore also boosts export performance. Now, the, the, the most important channel that links import duties to exports is actually on, the, on those firms that are not yet exporting. And what import, lower import duties do is they give incentives for firms to move away from the domestic market and into the export market. So on the export side, what we see when we look at data and when we look at international experience is that lower import duties will increase the size of the export pie. Where the concern comes is what is going to happen with import competing sectors. So if you decrease that, if all of a sudden, you will have more import competition. And that import competition may affect those sectors in Pakistan that are inward looking, that are supplying to the domestic market. So that's, that's where the challenge from a you know, pol policy perspective lies. And this is why it is very important. The sequence of reforms is very important. You're talking and about me... the protectionist side of import tariffs, that the, the national side local, local small industry would be affected by it. Small or large, it's not necessarily small. The auto sector is not small and is highly protected. If you reduce yeah, yeah. import duties on cars, mm -hmm. those are not small firms, but those are going yeah. to be affected because they will face more competition domestic. Yeah. Is that good or bad for productivity? For productivity, it's likely to be good. More competition will be good. Those resources that are held in, in those sectors uh, are going to be released to sectors that are more competitive, and that's going to increase productivity. But there is a genuine concern for what is going to happen with, say, employment in those sectors. So what other countries that have opened up have done is to sequence reforms in a way in which the outcomes tend to be better. And I'm going to give you a particular example. When Taiwan opened up and when Taiwan opened and, and changed its model of development away from import substitution, substitution and into an export-led growth model of development, yeah. The, the way or the, the, the way they did it was first they let the exchange rate float. So when the exchange rate floated, it depreciated. So the currency depreciated. And yeah. as the currency depreciated, that depreciated currency acts as a barrier, a natural barrier against being flooded with imports. It also acts as an incentive to export more because your exports become cheaper and therefore you're more competitive and imports become naturally more expensive. So the appreciation of the currency is um, in a way a natural shield against 
imports and a natural boost to your export sector. So when you're when you let the exchange rate float and the currency reaches a level that is competitive, so it depreciates, that is a good opportunity for you to introduce this type of reforms that are productivity enhancing. You can gradually reduce import duties because in a way you're protected by the exchange rate that has depreciated. And that gives you time for domestic industry to adjust to new conditions. So it gives you temporary project protection because that depreciated exchange rate gives you that temporary protection. So that type of sequence, first let the exchange rate adjust and then move with opening up to trade has been, has proven to be uh, quite an effective way of doing it. Okay. So, so Gonzalo, uh, the other part of the report, uh, I think a large part uh, is, of course, focused on productivity, and you have very uh, succinctly and uh, nicely answered uh, all my questions on that. There's one part that focuses on females and female labor force uh, participation. Uh, in Pakistan, we've seen that there are a lot of cultural constraints to female labor force participation. And, and and gender wage gaps uh, and artificial barriers to entry in the labor market exist everywhere in the world. Do you think that Pakistan's case is peculiar in the first instance? And do you think these cultural constraints could be removed? Is this, is this an economic issue in your eye or is this more a cultural issue? Well, it's, it's both, right? It is an economic issue in the sense that, uh, look, the, the growth of Pakistan has been stunted by its inability to allocate resources, but also by its yeah. inability to allocate talent. And when I say yeah. talent, most of this challenge is related to low female labor force participation. You have about a female labor force participation rates that are close to 24%. That places Pakistan among the lowest uh, in the world, in the, the, the lowest records in terms of female labor force participation in the world. Now, you're keeping a large portion of your population and therefore of your talent outside yeah. the labor force. So that is a drag on economic activity. We estimate that if you basically match the levels of female labor force participation that you have in Bangladesh, that is a country that has similar cultural norms as Pakistan, then you would accrue GDP gains of up to 23%. So that basically is almost a, a, your, your, the size of your economy would grow by about a quarter uh, if labor force participation rates match Bangladesh. I'm not talking about matching Norway. I'm talking about matching Bangladesh, a country that has similar um, gender norms as, as Pakistan. So what, what, in a way, yes, there are gender norms. There are gender norms that are cultural, but there's, there's, uh, there are a number of other things that the country could be doing to stimulate the participation of females in the labor market. One of the things that we see when we look at the data of female labor force participation is uh, a U-shaped relationship. So at, lows, at low levels of, of income, you have that female labor force participation rates are relatively high. So in a way, poverty trumps gender norms. If you're poor, you have to work. It doesn't matter if you're female or male. You have to work. You have no other option. Now, what happens is that as uh, as the income levels of the household in which you're in start increasing, then female labor force participation rates fall, 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 fall. And then in the in the high uh, income households, so when you're at the top of the income distribution of households, then female labor force participation rates are increasing again a little bit. Yeah. So what that is saying is that there is something in the middle there that is that is happening. And that something in the middle has a lot to do with employment in manufacturing. Employment in manufacturing is where the challenge is the largest for females. What we see in the data is that female labor force employment in manufacturing is at 4% in Pakistan. 4% is extremely, extremely low. And what happens there is not so much related to gender. I mean, gender norms play a role, but what happens there is that there is a, an enabling infrastructure that is missing. A key element here is safe transport. So transport infrastructure is crucial for females to be able to go to work. So those that want to go to work, but they don't have access to safe transport are not going to be 
able to go to work. And that has nothing to do with cultural norms. That has to do with a lack of public infrastructure when it comes to providing safe transport. And this is why an, another interesting finding that we have is, as I was mentioning, there is this U-shaped relationship between labor force participation of females and income. Now, when you break that down, districts that have high connectivity and those that have low connectivity, you see that that inverted U shape disappears for high connectivity districts. So what does that mean? What it means is that if you give connectivity, so if you're in districts in which there is connectivity, connectivity that could be internet connectivity, but also in a way that's a proxy for transport connectivity. More connected this more connected districts that are, you know, that have high internet connectivity are also going to be districts that have better transport connectivity. When you have transport connectivity, then women work more. So safe transport is a crucial element to ensure to boost female labor force participation. But there are other there is there is a, a challenge that also employers face that is what economists call a coordination failure. And I'll explain you what yeah. this coordination failure is. You may be an employer, right? And you want to hire women. Now, for you to hire women, you need to set up your plant in a way that you have dedicated restrooms, for example, for females. You may have dedicated spaces for females to work safely in. You're only going to do those adjustments in your plant if you can get a sizable number of females to work for you. Not for one, a sizable number. You need to have now, a daycare and other facilities also, right? Yes. Daycare, daycare is more sophisticated. Not many have daycare, but let's say dedicated restrooms, dedicated spaces, etc., dedicated transport. Now, females are not going to be willing to supply their labor, so they are not going to be willing to go and work if those spaces are not available in the factories. But you're not willing to set up those spaces if females are not willing to go to work. So you see, this is a chicken and egg problem. So yeah, if someone yeah. comes and says, you know what? Yeah. You mandatorily need to invest in this type of infrastructure, then, or and perhaps public policy can help in a way that because it could chip in part of the costs, right? Then what we would see is that more females would be offering their, their labor, more females would be willing to work, and it would be profitable for employers actually to pay for those investments in infrastructure. So that is uh, something that, that could be uh, done to improve female labor force participation in Pakistan, particularly in manufacturing. All right, Gonzalo, my last question, and I would appreciate, uh, <laughs> thank you. You've been, uh, you've been uh, very patient uh, uh, on this interview and you've uh, answered all the questions in a lot of detail. So thank you for that. And uh, my last question would be, uh, you know, I would just want a one line uh, response on that. What do you think is the one big headline thing that the government of Pakistan should do tomorrow to bring Pakistan, you know, you know, on the productivity side, perhaps, you know, where should we start from? And that one thing that the government should do immediately. And do you really think on the uh, on the IMF side that, you know, Pakistan government should really implement the IMF proposals and implement a, a, a stabilization sort of a regime as opposed to, you know, trying to uh, go on a growth path that the governments have continued to do in the past? One line, if I'm only given one line, what I would say is <laughs> address, address. You can take two. The... You can take two, Gonzalo. <laughs> address the distortions. And when I say address the distortions, I mean ensure you're taxing land and real estate fairly. And that will be the best start so that resources start flowing away from real estate and into dynamic tradable sectors. And once that yeah. happens, you will see faster growth, faster productivity gains, and more employment of good quality taking place in Pakistan. Of course, there's much more to do, you gave me one line, so that is what I suggest. Property taxes, consider property taxes, consider tax on, on land seriously, uh, seriously done. Thank you so much for joining me, Gonzalo, and taking out time for this interview. I would also like to particularly thank uh, Musharraf Zaidi and Shahab Siddiqui for coordinating this with you and the Tabad Lab team for launching the report alongside the World Bank. Gonzalo, with 
carry the conversation forward and uh, thank you for your services to Pakistan and for joining me. Thank you so much, Asad, for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you.